Yes, we do, Lord. Hallelujah. I like the feet. I like what I got, man. Wow. I ain't mad at you. I know that's right. Glory to your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Well, come on. Let's bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's bless the Lord. Welcome to New Life Christian Fellowship here at 1321 Providence Road in Brandon. Amen. Under the leadership of our dearly beloved. Bishop Dr. Robert L. Register, amen. Thank you all for tuning in with us via Facebook Live. Thank you all for tuning in when we post on YouTube. We thank and praise God for all of you who have come out here this evening, you know, to time and time again to be able to host and have this service for those who are not able to come and to physically be in the house of the Lord. It makes a difference sometimes when you can take that opportunity to come in, we know that there's a lot of things that's going on, but we still love you out there. We encourage you to continue to seek the Lord that time will be allotted for you all to come in and join us physically here during our midweek service hour. Amen. Amen. It's a great sacrifice that we come here to be able to give this service and this opportunity for unity and worship so we thank and praise God for those of you who are connecting with us the Bible says in Psalms 91 he that dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty I will say of the Lord he is my, my refuge, refuge and my fortress my God in, in him, him will, I trust. will I trust Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Mm. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield Jesus. and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth by day, nor the pestilence that walketh in darkness nor for the destruction that wasted at noonday. Jesus. A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. No matter what's going on in the world and in the Ukraine and Poland and Africa and England and all over this country, Father, we thank you. We thank you for blessing and keeping us, O oh God. We thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for your knowledge. We thank you for your understanding. And God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy upon our lives, oh God. We pray now, Father God, that you anoint this service tonight, oh God. We pray that you give the clarity of the word of God as it comes through the man of God that you have deemed at this time to be the shepherd of this house. And we thank you for him, oh God. We give you praise, honor, and glory, O oh God, that as we feast on the word, O oh God, that we will receive everything that you have for us tonight, that we may be better stewards, that we may be better Christians, that our lives, O oh God, will continue to be transformed, O oh God, to draw closer and closer to you. Now, Father God, those who have personal needs, O oh God, we extend our hands and our hearts to them and ask you, Lord Jesus, to extend your mercy and go and meet the needs of those, oh God, who are sitting there right now, Father God, unsure. They're not certain of where their next meal will come from, oh God. They're not certain, Lord, of housing, God. They're uncertain, oh God, where they're going to move, oh God. They're uncertain of health care. They're uncertain of financial challenges, but you know, God. So we pray right now, Father God, that you be the healer, you be the deliverer, that you go and touch them right where they are in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we give you praise, we give you glory, and we give you honor in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, wherever you are right now, if you're watching us via Facebook, YouTube, come on, just give the Lord a hand of praise. He inhabits your praises on tonight. I know the folks in the building can do it, amen, but I want you that are sitting at home, 
wherever you are, in your cars, in your living room, in your dining room, in your bedroom, just give God a hallelujah praise. Just wave your hands to the Lord and just let him know, amen, how much you're grateful for his goodness. Let him know how much you're so thankful for what he's done for you. Hallelujah. And in doing so, amen, we can give him the highest praise. The song says, hallelujah. Oh, Lord, we praise your name. Hallelujah. In spite of what day you may have had, he still that gets his glory. All the praises belong to him. All the glory belongs to our God. <laughs> Yay. Oh, Lord, we praise your name tonight. Very simple song, but yet powerful. We sing this. Hallelujah. My Hallelujah. Oh Lord, we praise your name. I'm not by myself. No, you're not, sir. So. We give you all. Dare you to sing it. Come on and join me. Come on. Hallelujah. Let's lift him up tonight. Hallelujah. Oh Lord, we praise your name. That's it. That's it. That's it. I can see some of you doing it right now. Come on, let's do it. Uh -huh. We give you all the glory. Yeah. towards heaven tonight. Hallelujah. He inhabits your praise. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 I think we can do it just 
one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's it, that's it, that's it. Hallelujah. Oh God, I feel your presence. Hallelujah. It doesn't take much. Come on, sing it. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, we thank you. Yes, we do. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you even when we don't deserve it. You've been good to us. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. You didn't let have it come in our way. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. Hallelujah, just for the last time before we move on to the next song. Say, Hallelujah. Oh, come on, lift him up tonight. Hallelujah. We all sound good tonight. Oh, Hallelujah.
those hands together. Amen. Bless your hands. Got me crying up here. <clears throat> Anybody else crying? All his presence is here, Bishop. Amen. Feel his presence. I really love the Lord. I really love the Lord. Just a little bit of that. Anybody really love him? I really do. I can't help myself. Yeah, I just can't help myself. You be, I just can't, man. I can't. That's what worship is about, man. <laughs> just a chorus of that. You know, you think of the goodness of Jesus. You know, a lot of my, I have a lot of friends that died. They didn't get as old as I am. I'm 67 years old. My mother only lived in 57. I'm thankful tonight. I know that's right. I'm thankful for the breath that I breathe. I'm thankful that I'm walking upright without a cane. I really love the Lord. I really do. I really do. Don't you miss this, did you? She worked well, well with you tonight, huh? Man, let's stop. So glad to have you. So glad to have those that are in our, in our seating audience. Thank God for you. Amen. I'm just happy to be alive. Happy to be saved. And yeah. God has a plan for my life. Do you know what his plan is for your life? Where are you at? stoplight, what intersection, what road are you on? Are you still waiting to have that, the, that Damascus, Damascus Road experience? Because you're still not all the way in. Father, help us tonight. Give clarity of speech, precision of thought, that at the end of this exercise, 
your name will be glorified and your people, no matter where they are, they'll be edified. In Jesus' name, someone say amen. Turn with me to Acts chapter number 1. We're looking at verse number 6 to 11. We're getting so close to Easter and so close to, to Pentecost. I think everything that we say and do will be about Christ and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I think that, you know, our society has, 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 has really um, elevated itself and transformed itself. And, you know, each generation changes things. The 17th century uh, wasn't like the 18th century. The 19th century wasn't like the 18th. The 20th wasn't like the 21st, and so on and so on. And people change. Cultures change. Attitudes change. And how we reach people may change, but the word won't change. Somebody say the word won't change. The word is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And one of the things that we have to be very mindful in a very fast-paced, fast-moving culture is that you don't, you don't cause the word to change, that it stays the same. And you have to be very careful that you're changing according to God's word. Let's read together. In fact, give it to me in the, in the Christian Standard Bible. I think the C, let's see. Yeah, CSB. You got that one? Give, all right, give me the NLT. New one I looked at. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him. Look now, they was with him, Minister Stinyard. They kept pulling on his coattail. Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? I want you to see that because they're talking to a resurrected Jesus. He got all the answers, everything that they ever thought he was or wasn't. They, 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 could, they could concur. He is the risen Savior. He is the Messiah. And they're asking him about some things that don't pertain to his flow and where he's going. He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times. And they are not for you to know. What an answer. He said, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me. Watch this. Everywhere. That should be your, your assignment. Telling people about Jesus everywhere. Go to the grocery store. Tell somebody in the grocery store about Jesus. Go to the library. Get your book out but make sure you tell somebody in the library about Jesus. Go to the cleaners. Tell somebody in the cleaners about Jesus. It says, telling me, tell somebody about me everywhere. Everywhere is, is clear. Now, it doesn't say, only tell people about me in church. Only tell people about me when you, when you have that moment. You, you feel good about me. He said, I want you to tell people about me everywhere. And, he, and he's speaking specifically to their location. He said, in Jerusalem, tell everybody about me. Don't, don't let any human being escape. Anybody that's mentally capable, <clears throat> that has cognition, he said, tell them about me. He said, tell them about me in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching. And <clears throat> they could no longer see him. And as they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven. But someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. So for the scripture. Amen. So I want to talk to you tonight about, <clears throat> about what our
purpose is, what our assignment is, and how we get so, so disconnected from what God has called us to do. Amen. So in the, in the text, the Bible says that Jesus promised them the kingdom. Somebody said, I've been promised the kingdom. One of the challenges today is that we have people that are coming to church and they, they lack so much. They're always looking for something. And we, we do everything that we can to find something in here that says God's going to give you a house and God's going to give you a car and God's going to make you happy. God's going to heal your body. And so it's almost as if we have to give out all these things that God can do for you because you can't do them for yourself or you're in need of them. And so people, instead of coming here to meet Jesus, they come here to get his stuff. We're looking for the stuff. I wish I had a witness in here. And this is the hour that the church is in. If we don't produce stuff, folk don't come. And even though we're in a pandemic, and the pandemic has not left us, and I understand why people have not come, but you can't tell me you have you stayed in that house 24-7. You're going somewhere. So he promises us a kingdom. Now, you might not be in a kingdom right now. You might be living in a democracy. But he promises us a kingdom. Now, the kingdom is not just the kingdom to come, but he promises to give us a kingdom where? In our hearts. Somebody say in our hearts. Over 500 disciples stood at some remote place, probably on the top of the mountain. They surrounded Jesus. And one of the disciples asked that revealing. He said, he said when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? That's, they longed for that. They didn't get over that call. They just they wanted to be put back in authority. When you hear Christians today, they, they long for their, their president or their representative to be in office. I wish I had amen. Uh, now that Biden is in, people that are Republican want a Republican in. And sometimes they, they want that more than they want Jesus. They fight about that. They argue about that. They watch hours on hours of, of TV all about that and ain't telling nobody about Jesus. He called everybody together and the reason for the, his stressing the importance of the meeting, meeting was such. The revealing thing in this was that disciples were still thinking in terms of earthly and physical. We must always remember Christ is going to set up his kingdom on earth one day in the future. And his kingdom as well as a present rule and reign in our hearts. His kingdom and his rule should reign in our hearts. His rule and reign will be done on earth. The Lord of prayer assures that. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Christ promised the apostles that they would sit upon the thrones and they would judge the people of Israel. He also promised believers that they would receive a hundredfold and rule over the world. But the concern of the believer is not to be a reward, not to crave things that are carnal, things that are transient. So we don't come here, and we got to be very careful that we, we're not preaching to people that long for power and position. They want influence. Church is becoming, depending on the size of your church and, and, and the amount of people you have there and, and how affluent your church is, people come to church for position and, and influence. They want to be influenced or they want to they meet people of influence. People like to come to church because if, if they're not somebody at work, they figure they, if they get in church for a while, they can get a position of authority and power. So people, are, people just because they come to church, it doesn't mean that they don't want power. <coughs> people want money and possessions. The disciples were no different. Listen, they saw him lifted up, but they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. You got to ask yourself, what is it that you want most of all? Are you longing for stuff? Are you longing to, to serve God? Recognition and prestige, rule and reign, material and physical, uh, and, and physical things on earth. The believer's concern is to be service and ministry. Somebody say service and ministry. When I first got saved, that's all I did was service and ministry. 
I had to get all the way in because if I didn't get all the way in at the age of 40, I wouldn't have got in. And maybe the reason a lot of people are not coming to church is because they never really ever got all the way in. If you ever really get all the way in, you can't ever unplug yourself again. I wish I had an amen in here. So the believer's concern is to be of service and ministry and proclaiming salvation and to meet the cry of a world that's buried in desperate needs. Christ is direct. He rebuked those who wished to pry into the timing of the Lord's return and setting up his kingdom upon earth. Christ had said that even he did not know when he was returned and set up the kingdom. So he rebuked the question. He said, it's not for you to know. The Father had put the times in his own power. Believers are not to focus upon prophecy and the setting of dates. They are not to be craving for the release from this world and for the heavenly positions of authority. What believers are to do is to look for Jesus' return and long for heaven. But even this, even the love of Jesus' return is not to get in the way of, of his task. Even though we love him, it can't get in the way of what we have to do. Yeah, people say, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. I love him. Yeah, I love him too, but you ain't doing nothing. And it, it, love is an action word. You can't say you love somebody and there's no activity. Amen. There has to be some action. It is not to get in the way. What is the task? It is the task of witnessing. I believe people are struggling with their rent and struggling with their bills because what God has asked you to do, you ain't doing. Struggling in your relationships, struggling where you shouldn't be struggling because the very thing that he asked you to do, we're not doing. Look at Mark chapter 13, verse 32. <clears throat> Mark chapter 13, verse 32. See, so we're not... We're not to be looking at times and see, yes, we ought to keep our one, we ought to keep our eyes open, be very circumspect. But don't be so overly indulged in what's going on with politics, what's going on in Ukraine, and what's going on with Putin, and what's going on with Biden, and what's going on with the Congress, and what's going on in the Supreme Court. We we so much care about that, we ain't got nobody saved. Nobody has gotten saved. I was talking to a friend of mine, and, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it seemed like that's all they talk about. Throw, they throw shade on each other, but nobody's getting saved. However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, <coughs> verse 12. <clears throat> now we see things imperfectly. You're looking at people, they're not perfect, they're imperfect. Looking at this ministry, we're not perfected, we're being perfected. You might see some flaws in, in what I'm saying or what, I, what we're doing, or you might see a mistake here because we're, we're imperfect and you're looking, you're looking with imperfect eyes. We see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything perfect. Clarity, with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. So the first thing that we must do, somebody said we must do, we must be witnesses. He says, he says I'm, the only reason I'm giving you power is to be a witness. I knew that I got that power because <clears throat> when I got saved, that's all I did. That's all I, I, everybody I saw, I witnessed to. Everybody. We, uh, my first preaching assignment was in a prison. I ministered, me and my wife ministered in a prison for two and a half years, I think. Every weekend I was up there. Nobody was paying me. I wasn't on TV. So there was no notoriety. It was just witnessing. You should have seen it. It was a women's prison. But I witnessed. I witnessed there. I witnessed at the embassy. Everywhere I went, I witnessed. I don't see nobody witnessing now but the Jehovah Witnesses. 
And since COVID hit, you don't see them either. You don't see nobody witnessing. You don't see anybody. The very thing, the very thing that God told the disciples to do, he told the church to do, witness. And we're not doing it. We sit and we get, we get very comfortable in our seats. And we don't move. He gives us power to witness. There are three significant factors. The believer's equipping power was to be the Holy Spirit. The disciples had asked about the kingdom, the positions of leadership and authority Christ had promised. <clears throat> the point is critical and to be noted with all diligence. They were to receive power, but not the kind of power that's on earth. Not the power of position, not the power of recognition, not the power of supervision, not the power of fame, not the power of wealth or politics. Their power was to be spiritual and supernatural. Spiritual and supernatural it was to be the very power of God himself imagine God giving you and me people that were so messed up so broken so dysfunctional he would release this kind of dudamas it's, it's the Greek word dudamas like dynamite he would give you something so powerful, not so that you can play with it, not so that you can, you can look at people and tell somebody that you're somebody special. You got a title now. No, he gives you power for a specific task. The power that you get is of God himself, of the supreme being of the universe. You get his presence and his spirit. His own spirit was to dwell within a heart and the life of the believer. Think about that for a minute. All these years you've been having all this aggravation, all this frustration, carrying around all these dead relationships and all this mess you've gone through, all this regrettable things that you've been carrying in your heart. And God is saying, now I want you to get rid of all that trash. And I want you to open your heart up for the kingdom. He said, if you open your heart up for the kingdom, you'll never be the same again. Anybody hear what I'm saying? I'm talking about experiencing something you've never experienced before in your life. This is why somebody likes me, really, I become real challenged when I see people in church because I know they haven't gotten the kingdom. Now, the kingdom has nothing to do with a loud mouth. I know I can be loud. I can be very, I can be very, very uh, uh, demonstrative at times because that's because of what I feel. I feel this thing. If I was playing baseball, I'd grab that bat, be ready to hit. If I was playing football, I'd be hyped up. And if I was driving race cars, I would still feel this energy that I have because that would be the task that God has assigned me to, a race car. But God, guess what? If I'm a race car driver, I'm still a witness. Experiencing the presence and power of God within the life was the summit. Can't nothing get better than that. The supreme experience of our lives, nothing else was ever needed. It is this for which the human heart craves. I know you crave a boyfriend or, or dad or company or, or this or good credit. I've craved all those things too. But guess what? When you get it, guess what? You got it. And, it, and guess what? It don't mean the same no more. Have you, ever, have you ever got a new car? It's new for how long, Joe? Just a little while. I don't care what it is, Bentley, whatever it is. It's only new for a little while. But God has given you something that's so profound. It's new every day. It's, it's profound every day. It's an experience. You experience the Lord every day of your life. What could be more exhilarating than that? God's spirit truly dwells within the person. And the person is supremely fulfilled and satisfied. Nothing else can ever satisfy him or her. Talk to me, somebody. We're so looking for people to satisfy us and her to satisfy me and him to satisfy me. No, God is the one to satisfy you. Not a position, not authority, not recognition of fame. People could take that back. Now that the person has truly received the spirit of God in his heart and life, the point is this, the believer is given a task by God, a mission to carry out on earth. 
However, the believer does not have the power to carry out that task unless the power of God himself resides in the believer. Guess what? You can't witness without the power. I can't preach without the power. I really can't live this Christian life without the power. I wish I had the amen. See, I don't know what, I don't, the, the psalmist was singing a little while, you don't know what he's done for me. I know what he's done for me. And I would not be able to be sober without the power. When would believers be gathered and clustered together in the fellowship and worship of God, free from worldly injustices and sin? Again, Christ had promised the kingdom a day when he would gather all believers together in perfect fellowship in heaven. Now in the time for believers to be revealing in the love or reveling in the love and the fellowship, the enjoyment and the comfort of each other. This was the crux of what Christ is saying. It is time for witnessing to the laws. Bearing witness to the truth about God and Christ. Witnessing about Christ. Sharing the gospel. Sharing the gospel is the great task of the believer. This is understandably clearly seen. For no greater truth exists in all the universe. Man can now live forever. Think about it. You tell somebody that, that believes that, that, that when, they, when they finish this earthly life that nothing else exists. You tell them, no, 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 that's not true. You can live forever. Man can now be delivered from sin, death, and hell. Just think about it. The perfect cure for sin has been secured. Death is known. Hell now exists. There's no reason for the world, no reason for any person to suffer any longer under the weight and the bondages of selfishness and hoarding, bitterness and hatred, war and power, emptiness and loneliness. You don't have to be lonely. You don't have to walk around in fear and in anguish when you got God. The hope of glory, the triune God himself occupying your space in your mind and your heart. You don't have to worry about inadequate supply and hunger, insecurity and low self-esteem, guilt and shame, ignorance and the unknown. God have mercy upon all who know the cure and keep silent. I'm going to say that again. God have mercy on all who know the cure but keep silent. No great indictment against a person exists. Now, no several point. The word you, it is the believer, it is the believer who is the witness. It is the believer who knows the cure. You can't tell somebody what you have not received yourself. You can't tell them in a way that's convincing enough. The words unto me, Christ is the message, not a man's idea, not even the idea of religion. His crucifixion. The word witness is the Greek word matures, and it means this is the same word of martyr. The believer is to be so committed to reaching people that he's ready to die to reach them. Can he get people to come back to church? Can he get people consistently enough to pray? That tells me they never received him. They might have accepted, they might have accepted the plan of salvation. But they have not been baptized. They don't have any power. Man, that's like, that's like getting a suit. But you know it's 20 degrees outside. You need, a, you need a coat on. The word witness, this is not a, co a command. Rather, it is a natural result of the Holy Spirit within a person. So is the power. The Lord says very simply that a spirit-filled person has power. A spirit-filled person has power. Amen. And they become a witness for him throughout the world. This is important because it makes power and witnessing trademarks of a Christian believer. A genuine believer possesses both the spirit and power in his life, and they become a, nat a nature, a force of nature unto themselves. The method, Jesus gives the method to believers to follow in his witness and for the spread of the gospel. The believers to witness where he is. I'm not in Jerusalem, so guess what? I'm in Tampa. I'm in Brandon. 
I'm in Val Rico. I'm in Riverview. Wherever you're at, that's where you're supposed to witness. That's the place. And we haven't gotten to it because that's not what we're hearing. We're hearing everything else. We hear everything else but what we should hear. And so we've not gotten back to a place where we need to be in the church is all disjointed. You can't get new converts without witnessing. You can't do baptism without witnessing. There has to be a desire to witness. Jerusalem was their home, their local community. In all Judea, other communities and areas and cities and states close by. In Samaria, other states and provinces where people are antagonistic. Samaria was a place that wasn't, wasn't a place that they would go to. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't like Samaritans. They called them dogs. But he said, look here, once you dealt with your house, once you dealt with the surrounding communities, don't leave Samaria out. Don't leave the hood out. Huh? If you have a problem with white people, don't leave their neighborhood out. If you have a problem with black people, don't leave their neighborhood out. Whatever you have a problem with, don't leave that neighborhood out. God wants you to go there no matter how antagonistic it is. You don't want, and you know why you can go? You got power. Then he says to the uttermost part of the earth, to the unknown countries and regions of the world. The critical point is this. The believer is to see that each area receives the message of Christ. He or she is to stay there, is to stay there before reaching out. But once the area knows the message, the message is to be carried out to another area, to another area, to another area. Witnessing, the word witness in the book of Acts is forceful. It reveals the duty of the believer. He said, but in Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power. He's not going to give you any power if you're not willing to witness. Why should I give you something that you're not going to use or you're not going to use right? In Acts 2.32, it says, this Jesus had God raised up, wherefore we are all witnesses. Acts 4.33 said, with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Listen, how do you think we are here today? When Jesus died on the cross, Judaism was, 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 the, was the religion of the, of the day. Judaism was the religion of the day. Islam had not yet come into existence. Did you hear what I said? Had not come into existence. So Judean, Judaism was the prominent religion. Then Christianity came. And they were not accepting. They were not accepting. The, the Bible said he came into his own and his own received him not. So they had to be committed to witnessing. Paul went everywhere witnessing. He went with his life being put on the line. He went places and he was whipped and thrown into prison. But guess what? He kept on witnessing. He never stopped witnessing. Look at Acts chapter 8, 30, 25. Acts 8, 35. So beginning with this same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. And they, when they had testified, they preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem, and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And you've got to be somebody that has experienced this. The reason most folk don't want to witness is because they ain't experienced it. They don't know what it's like. The, 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 the jury is still out whether hell exists or not. Have you been saved from hell? Hell fire. God has been, God then took me out of hell. Amen. Give me a new start and a new life. That's something to tell other people. So witnessing is critical. Look at Acts chapter 
chapter 10, verse 39 to 43. That's our job. Our job is to witness. Somebody say witness. So if you're not doing that, don't expect to get much. You're not doing your job. You got to witness. They're not listening to you at home. Go to your job and witness. But don't make excuses about nobody wants to listen to you. <laughs> no, the people that you're witnessing to don't want. But you got to pray in the morning, God, take me, put me in a place where people want to hear you. Help me, help me find somebody that needs you today, God. And we apostles are witnesses. See, I'm a witness. I'm a witness. Somebody say I'm a witness. What were they witness? They were witness of all he did. So they were the perfect, they were the perfect people to, to share Christ. They knew everything he did. So uh, it's, it's, it's my, my belief that, that people struggle with witnessing because they don't know much about him. They know a couple of stories and they're convicted in their heart not to do it because they know they're not sold out. Whenever you're sold out to something, you'll tell somebody about it. Amen. I, I remember uh, here in Florida, how many know it gets real hot here? Colin Seganay said no. And listen, every now and then, uh, they'll have somebody out here at the tax place or selling something. They have a big old sign up. And you'll see them dressed with stuff. You say, my God, how could he be in that outfit and it's 100 degrees outside. How? i tell you how. They paying him. And he or she need that money. Now, you would say, I ain't going to go out there and do that. But obviously, that person that's out there can't say that. They're out there doing it because they realize that this is the platform they got to make ends meet. You got to know Jesus. And he said, we apostle witness of all he did. All he did throughout Judea and Jerusalem, they put, him in, they put him to death by hanging him on the cross. They knew. But God raised him to life on the third day. Then God allowed him to appear, not to the general public, but to us whom God chose in advance to be his witness. We were those who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us. To preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all, the living and the dead. He is the one all the prophets testified about saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. Anybody see that? Go to me to Acts chapter 2 for a moment. Starting in verse 32. Peter is now preaching to them. Peter has the anointing of God. The Holy Ghost is on this man. And he's telling him, this is the, the, the tail end of the story. He said, God raised Jesus from the dead. And we are all witnesses of this. Verse 33. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven. At God's right hand and the Father. As he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see and hear today. They were saying, look, you, what you see is what he spoke about. For David himself never ascended to heaven, yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand. Until I humble your enemies and making them a footstool under your feet. So let everyone, let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. They had the story. They had it down packed. And Peter's word, watch this, he preached so powerful that his words pierced their hearts. When last time you pierced somebody's heart? I'm not talking about throwing shade at them. Anybody can throw a little shade and make somebody upset, get somebody angry. But I mean, pierce their heart because you, you level some truth on them. Peter's word pierced their hearts and they said to them, 
and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Next verse. For this promise is to you, to your children and to those of far away and all who have been called by the Lord our God. Keep going. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Verse 41. And those who believe what Peter said, watch this, were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. Can he get people to come to church? We do an altar call. We, we do an altar call for salvation. We don't know if they're out there. We don't know what's going on. Are their hearts being pierced? And the people whose hearts should be being pierced are those that call themselves believers, but they really don't feel, they don't feel like you and I feel. They don't have the same level of commitment. They don't have the same joy. Those who believe what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. Verse 42. All the believers devoted themselves. See this? Hold up now. All the believers. When they had a prayer meeting, guess what? Everybody was there. When the church opened up, everybody, all the believers were devoted. They were devoted, 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 devoted. Tom Brady just came back to football. Guess what? His fans are devoted to him. The, the Raymond St. James Stadium, guess what? It's going to be packed when football season because they're devoted, but they're devoted to the wrong things. I ain't throwing no shade on Tom Brady, but guess what? There's no guarantee Tom Brady going to live that whole year or anybody for that matter. All believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. So the first thing I did was I got involved. I, and even though I wasn't going to Bible college and I wasn't in school, I started reading seven or eight hours a day. I fully immersed myself in the things of God. Have you ever done that? What are you waiting on? All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to fellowship. You see, once you start fellowship, you can't just quit fellowshipping. Once you start fellowshipping, you just don't quit fellowshipping. If you like boys, you don't stop liking boys. If you, don't, if you like girls, you don't stop liking them. They were committed to fellowship, watch this, and to sharing meals. According to the Lord's Supper and to prayer, they were all committed to prayer. We got to beg people to pray now. We got to ask them, will you pray? Will you, will you come out? And watch this. A deep sense of awe came upon them all. When you have an atmosphere like that, it's set up for miracles. When you have an atmosphere like that, Miracles will move around the whole place. A deep sense of awe came upon them all, and the apostles performed what? Many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together, watch this, in one place, and they shared everything they had. You know what that means? In, in, the, in the King James, it said, it said, it said that, that, they, that everybody had what they needed to get by. They shared, so nobody was left out. Nobody was left out. That was the early church. Now what do we have? What do we got going on now? It's almost like a hot mess. This pandemic has really demonstrated what you really love. Hmm? It came for a reason. Came to kill some people. Aren't you glad it didn't kill you? Can I get a big shout of amen? amen. But what, what it didn't come to do for those that are believers is to stop us from fellowshipping. 
this idea that you don't have to fellowship anymore really speaks to the fact that maybe the triune God has never really gotten inside of you. Anybody that ever, that ever did any running that likes to run, they don't stop running because they get old. It's something they enjoy doing. And they run all the time, even when they get old. People like baseball when they're young. They don't like, they don't unlike baseball when they get older. You always like it. How is it that at, that at some point in your life you like church and now you don't like church? I'll tell you how that is. It's because you really never had that kind of encounter. When you have that kind of encounter, that kind of that kind of monumental move of God where you meet him, like the woman at the well, the Bible said when she met him. They were having dialogue back and forth. She said that uh, our people worship in the mountain. You all worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, hey, the hour is coming and now is that you would no longer worship in that mountain or Jerusalem. He said, but you worship the Father in spirit and in truth for the Father is looking for such worshipers. And she, she, then she perceived that he was somebody special. And then he, he, he got into a business. He, he said, uh, go get your husband. And then she was honest. She said, I ain't married. The man I'm with right now is not my money. My, he, and she said, in fact, you've had five husbands. And at, at some point, she realized she was talking to God. She came there for some water. Good God Almighty. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I said, she came there for some water. But, she, but when, the, when the God got inside of her, she forgot what she came there for. She dropped the water, Joanne. She dropped the water and she did what? It was an instinctive move. When you get saved, you got to tell somebody. You, you can't hold it to yourself. You got to show them what God has done for you. Do I have a witness in here? There's no way you experience salvation and you keep it to yourself. Just like us, when we, we, we got clothes, we always put them on. My mother said, you ain't, go, wait till school start tomorrow. You put this clothes on that night because you... I guess somebody was like me. You're so excited about putting that stuff on. But when you save, listen, you want to tell somebody. Because you're excited. Because you know he called you out of darkness and into light. My time is up. I'm not out of word. Listen, I, I don't know where you've been and where you, uh, how you got there. I know that the pandemic has come. It has caused a lot of consternation, a lot of frustration. It, it has caused some misery. It's caused death. But you can't let a pandemic stop you from fellowship. You can't let a job, a husband, a wife, divorce, not even death stop you. The Bible says, what shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation? Shall war? Show things to come, things of past, nothing. And the only reason why things separate us from him is because he's not really in us. If I wasn't pastoring this church, I'd be somewhere in somebody's church. Because I love him. And when I, when I accepted him as my savior, best thing that ever happened to me. And I want to encourage you today to reevaluate whether or not you really got saved. Getting saved is, 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 uh, is greater than graduating from college. If that's the highlight of your life, graduating from college, getting saved is greater than you getting married or having sex the first time. It's much more important than that. It deals with eternity, eternity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believeth him shall never perish but have life everlasting. Time to reevaluate. Look at yourself. I'm not here to judge, but I'm, I'm here to tell you that the church has, has, has missed the mark. And, and if you're praying for God to restore and bless and heal and deliver and keep you safe, 
How can that be when you're not doing what he asked you to do? It's a simple thing, witness. But it's hard to witness about something that you don't know anything about. It's hard to witness about something that you don't have an ongoing relationship with. When I leave here tonight, I'm going to have a relationship with God. I'm going to talk to him, thank him. I'm going to bless him. I'm going to worship him all the way home. God bless you. When I get home, I'm going to spend some time with him. I'm not saying that's all I do, but I do enough to stay connected. I value the Lord of God in my life. The churches are empty because folk ain't never really got it. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray. Pray for restoration. Some were just told all they had to do was to repeat after me. They repeated and they didn't feel anything. And since they didn't feel anything, their life has really not changed. I pray for this, this night, the 16th of March, for real transformation. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Pray for healing and deliverance in that name. I pray for restoration in that name. And I pray for all those who are comfortable with their location right now. I pray you look back in that Bible once again. And the very least you should be doing is witnessing. How do I know that? Because the Bible says that he gives an example of, of the talents. He says... He gives us a story of the talent show. What he said, I gave you five. I gave Carla two. I gave Joanne one. He said, at some point, I'm going to come back and collect them. He goes to you. He says, hey, I gave you five. What? You said, well, guess what? I took the five you gave me and made five more. He said, blessed are you. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you rule over many. He says to the person he gave two to, what did you do? He said, I, I, did, I did the math. I, I took the two and I made two more. Then he goes to the one. He said, I know you're a tough man. So I took what you gave me and I buried it. Have you buried your gift? Is that why we don't see you? Have you buried it? Do you realize that you, you don't control the hourglass of your life? Your light bill might be paid, but is your eternal bill paid? Those lights can get cut off at any moment. All your bills could be paid, but have you paid the price yet? If you ask Jesus to come into your heart, you know, ask him to come and sup with you. Hear my cry tonight, beloved of God, wherever you're at, family members. Don't fool yourself. Don't, don't fool yourself. It's not me measuring who you are. You're, you're, the, you're the measuring rod. You ought to know if you have a connection with him or not. Whether or not, and I'm not talking about you witness every now and then. It is something that you do. Something that you faithfully do. And you can't just witness and not have fellowship. I'm talking about you witness, but you don't have fellowship. That sounds kind of, kind of broke down and crooked. It all goes together. Do not forsake yourself from assembling with the saints. My time is up. Come on, let's take up an offering. I can go on and on. Amen. Come on and clap your hands if you love me. I've been witnessing a long time. Just talking to some people over the phone. I begin to remind myself how long I've been witnessing. Sherwood, I've been witnessing a long time, man. A long time. I witnessed on airplanes. When I went to Africa, we wasn't that, we was we landed in a we was in London. We were flying from London to Ghana. He was in the air 20 minutes, and I got a soul one in the air, in the air, man. Didn't even know who she was. When I got to Africa, we started witnessing in the streets. I was the only one that had, a, had somebody that I witnessed to that came to church that night. I've been witnessing a long time. When I got to Tampa, I'd have been in all these old hoods and every place you could think of. Crack dens, I've been all over, Joanne, witnessing. Our church was in the inner city. I witnessed all over this place. Why are you not witnessing? Let him get inside you. I tell you, you can't stop. It would be like fire shut up in your bones. 
Stretch your hands towards the offering. Father, we thank you for what you've done tonight. Thank you for charging us once again with the task that nobody else can do but believers. Thank you for giving us this awesome responsibility. Now, God, bless the offering that came in. Bless those that are giving by, by online. Give back seed to the sow and bread to the eater. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. Let's stand for the benediction. Amen. I really love the Lord Sherwood. Of course, he loved me. Loved me through all my faults. All my human frailties. I can't help but love him. And he resides inside of me. The presence of the Lord is in my heart. I have the kingdom in my heart. I'm a king's child. All hearts and minds clear. Father, we thank you for what you said to us tonight. We promise to do better. Forgive us of our trespasses, our sins. Those of us that are believers that have not witnessed, that have not gotten up with witnessing on our minds, not going to bed with witnessing on our minds. It's just one task you said to witness. Just witness. Help us, help us once again take that noble responsibility. Help us block out all the noise and the, and the things that we hear and on the news and politics and who we want to be elected. If we could have so much fervency about that and not have no fervency about witnessing something is wrong with with your conversion. Now unto him who's able to keep each of us from falling. He alone has the power to present each of us faultless in the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, to me, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. And may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit once again fire you up like you've never been fired up before. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. We love you. God bless you. I'm, I'm, I'm praying for you. I'm praying that the fire of God once again reignite in your life. That you can be the person that God wants you to be. In Jesus' name, we love you. Take us home, Sherwood. Amen.